Yeah, good evening, everybody, or good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. In fact, uh, you can let us know where you are uh, in the chat. Um, yeah, glad so many of you are, are here with us tonight. We're expecting a few more people to drop in, but uh, yeah, time will, will tell how many of you there will be in the end. Um, yeah, my name is Max Wolf. I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, addiction researcher. I'm a member of the science department at the Mind Foundation. And this is the third episode of uh, the Zooming In webinar series within the Mind Academy. The name Zooming In is supposed to convey the fact that we're having in-depth conversations with researchers and therapists involved in psychedelic therapy and neighboring disciplines. And uh, at this point, it's always time for a disclaimer. When we talk about psychedelic therapy or psychedelic interventions here, we always refer to legal treatments that uh, take place in a professional clinical setting, a highly controlled context. We do not endorse unsupervised self-medication with psychedelics or the use of illegal underground therapies. Our guest today is Dr. Lee Roseman, who's joining us from Wales. It's not the jungle, it's Wales actually, he told me. <laughs> um, and yeah, he will introduce himself in a few moments. Uh, Lear and I will, will have a conversation for about one hour. And after that, we'll do a 30 minutes Q&A. Please use the, the Q&A button um, to post your questions to Lear and me. And you can already start posting your question while, while Lear and I are still in conversation. You, you don't have to wait until we finish. And you can use the chat for technical questions, all kinds of comments, and for chatting, of course. And operating in the background, we have Patrick Ventorp. Patrick uh, is our technical moderator today. He will also post links to interesting stuff that is related to what Lira and I will be talking about. So interesting papers, related events. So please leave the chat open so that you don't miss any of that. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lee Roseman. Lior, very happy to have you on the show. Thank you. Welcome. Very, very happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it really looks great uh, where you are. Uh, uh -huh. Maybe I'll, I'll move outside for the next uh, episode <laughs> as well. Could you, Leo, could you say a few words uh, about who you are, what you do? Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me here. It's the first time since COVID began that I speak in public. Uh, and it's kind of like kind of weird, like again, to, to do this. Uh, and it's kind of a good, uh, I think, a good framework just to speak with you and to speak to many people at the same time. Uh, I kind of enjoy that. And I'm a neuroscientist by training. I study uh, psychedelics in Imperial College London in the lab of uh, Robin Carr Harris and David Nutt. I'm a postdoc right now, and I also did my master's and my PhD in the same lab. So a lot of my research is kind of focused on fMRI and different, different like uh, neural changes that relate to different experiences with psychedelics. So people were scanned with LSD or psilocybin or DMT in the scanner and kind of just seeing what are the changes in the brain. And then a lot of the other research is about uh, therapy. So the kind of psychological mechanism behind and the therapeutic process with psychedelics. So kind of more clinical research. And right now I'm focusing mostly on ritual and social elements of psychedelics and psychedelics for peace building. Uh, we'll get there, I think. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm very sure we will. Yeah, looking forward to, to cover all that. So today's topic is, is psychological mechanisms of psychedelic therapies, or maybe we should say more broadly psychedelic interventions or psychedelic experiences. So the, the, the broad question is how do psychedelics work? Uh, how do they change people in the long term, or how do, do they even change societies or groups of people in the long term? What's the psychology behind these often seemingly miraculous transformations? And I have to say that my own views on this topic have been quite strongly influenced by your work, Leo. Oh, um, in the, especially your work in the context of psilocybin for depression, uh, uh, that, that study that you did, in, or you and your colleagues did in, in uh, London at Imperial College. Maybe can you explain a bit what what is your or what was your or is your role in uh, the psychedelic therapy studies at Imperial? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, st studying the mechanism, the psychological mechanism, involved also in the design and things like this. 
and sometimes sitting for for patients, but I'm not a psychologist or I'm not a I'm not a psychologist by training or a therapist by training, but it happens that in different studies I also sit for for patients or subjects. Uh, but my main role is more as a researcher studying kind of the mechanism uh, behind psychedelics and psychedelics for therapy. Mm. Um, well, I, I guess we should we should explain to to people. So there there has been a, a study, uh, an initial um, open label study in in London, uh, psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. It has been finished, I guess, in two thousand sixteen, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And uh, since that, so that that's the, one of the most or one of the, the frequently cited, um, already published uh, studies on on psychedelic therapy in modern times. And uh, at the moment, or uh, maybe uh, you, you could say something about the next study that was done after that, the Psilocybin for Depression 2, mm -hmm. which was a, a randomized control trial, right? Yes. Uh, so the study would just finish uh, uh, kind of the data collection, and now we're analyzing data. But the first study was for treatment-resistant uh, depression, and the current study is, uh, is for depression, uh, usually first episode depression, and it's uh, psilocybin compared to escitalopram. So psilocybin compared to SSRIs and kind of investigating different hypotheses uh, on that kind of the difference between them. And these hypotheses were developed in the first study and now this second study is kind of a way to test it. Yeah, I, I assume everybody, not only me, everybody's really excited to to see those results. Uh, yeah, they're good results. Probably can't say anything. I'm not going to ask. Uh, we'll, I can we'll just say, just... I guess I can just say they're they're good results. Yeah, they're good results. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, I would have thought, I wouldn't have mm -hmm. um, expected otherwise. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm still really excited to see them. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, so you said you you um, you you're mainly involved as a researcher, but you also um, joined ther therapy sessions, so you, you did preparation yeah. or dosing sessions with subjects as well? Mainly we have another study for healthy volunteers, so it's kind of a general well-being stu study for naive, naive uh, subjects, so people that come for the first time and they get a psychedelic in a therapeutic setting, but not with any kind of clinical, uh, kind of just healthy volunteers. So, right. so in this study I was sitting for, for subjects, they were not patients. Right. And, but it's like a very therapeutic process as well with them. Yeah. Great, yeah. So what so maybe this is a good point to start. So when you're you have experience sitting with people um in psychedelic sessions in a in a research setting. Mm -hmm. So there is this this model of thinking in, in psychedelic uh, therapy that this the psychedelic session or the experience, the, the quality of the psychedelic experience. Is predictive of long-term changes. Mm -hmm. um, so, my question for you, as someone who, who has um, accompanied people undergoing these these experiences, um, so th there is a couple of of uh, experiential qualities that are known to to be associated with positive long-term outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, um, mystical experiences, emotional breakthrough experiences. Is it possible as a sitter to 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 see that people are having a, a, an experience like that, or or is it like a black box? Yeah, sometimes sometimes it's black box. Sometimes it's like it's really hard to know what's happening from the out, kind of observing it from outside. But sometimes it's obvious that something big is happening. So, I mean, cathartic or emotional breakthrough experience. They usually there's usually an emotional expression. Uh, so these, ex these moments are e more easily identified, uh, whether it's crying, uh, kind of weeping, uh, it's usually obvious. Uh, with mystical type experiences, sometimes a person could be very, very, very quiet uh, and he's just in bliss, you know, uh, but it's hard to, but sometimes it's very ecstatic as well. So there's more variance there. Right. Yeah, could, could you? Uh, so these are the main two, right? The, that that are in the focus of research uh, moment: emotional breakthrough and mystical. Yeah, I would I would say uh, I mean it's like it's always a thing of like what is quantified compared to what is also known from like the clinical experience or from uh, qualitative research. Uh, so there are a few other things which are important, and I would say uh, cognitive insights play a crucial role as well. 
they're not necessarily an emotion, strong emotional experience. They might have an emotional kind of connection, uh, but these are usually just strong moments of insights. Uh, could could and, you give some some typical examples of of cognitive insights that would be associated with positive long term outcomes in in patients or healthy volunteers? Yeah, it it, it can be a realization of like of different. Uh, elements of one's relations or one life. So I realized that I'm always like this and like this to my wife. And, and actually I want to change that, you know, there's just like kind of revelations, realizations, they can be very I'm cliche. Nice <laughs> What's that? I'm too nice to her. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, or th things like this, it can be any realization. So it's not just the, the emotional expression, and it's not just a kind of unitive moment, but it's also just more concrete realizations uh, of someone's kind of life, behavior, actions, relations. Yeah. Right. So, um, what else? What, what else do you have in mind apart from from uh, cognitive realizations, emotional yeah. breakthrough? You you had a you had a, a fantastic paper on emotional breakthrough. I know the the like the idea yeah. of emotional catharsis or, or breakthrough is has been around for a long time uh, not yeah. only in psychedelic research but, but in, in psychotherapy in general yeah um, but you uh, kind of formalized this for the context of, of psychedelic therapies or psychedelic use um, yeah. could you explain a bit what the um, what your, your your intention was when developing yeah. this scale yeah so I guess my intention was, First of all, like the, the paper I wrote before was about how mystical type experience predict the clinical outcomes in depression. So those who had more uh, reduced depression uh, had more better clinical outcomes. Sorry, better, like higher mystical experiences. But then when I started kind of getting in the literature, I kind of realized that this is the only thing that we quantify, but actually clinicians know much more than that or qualitative research know, knows much more than that. And so I just said, I want to quantify more elements in order to kind of expand the story just from the mystical type experience to other elements of the of the clinical uh, kind of process. Uh, so whether it's like uh, psychedelic therapy in, you know, 50s and 60s in Europe was not was with lower doses and and was not necessarily aimed for full-blown mystical experiences but more for a reaction or catharsis and more kind of psych psychoanalytic processes and it was and it's kind of known in psychedelic therapy that these play an important part so it's just like was me trying to quantify it because what is quantified it is is what is like uh conveyed in message you know it's easy it's easier to convey the message kind of when it's quantified yeah yeah, yeah. So you, you validated this uh, this instrument in a survey in a, in a quite yeah. uh, elaborate survey study where you uh, um, uh, was a prospective survey where people who were planning to undergo a psychedelic experience um, yeah. register themselves and then they get questionnaires weeks before to measure yeah. traits personality traits yeah. and then days before and then briefly before the the, the experience and then afterwards and then long term. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. a, uh, that's a that's a really big effort you did there, uh, and you have some yeah. some really nice results. Uh, not only with okay. that, study, but regarding the the emotional breakthrough inventory, can you explain what you found there? So yeah, so the questions in the inventory are are kind of like I I dealt with emotions that I usually push aside. I experienced an emotional release. Uh, these are kind of their type of questions. It's six questions the inventory itself. And what I found in the study is that it can predict changes in well-being, but it's it is like added variance to the mystical type experience. So this together with peak experience or mystical type experience, both together can predict uh, changes. It, it's not I did not intend it to kind of replace, and I don't see it as a replacement of that, but it's just like an addition, an expansion right, yeah. on so what they, they we already know. Unique variance. Yeah, exactly. It explains unique variants. Mm. Another thing that was seen there and was seen in other studies was that a challenging experience actually is a negative predictor of outcome. And this is kind of interesting because a lot of times we say that 
challenging experiences are important for the therapeutic process. But I think what the uh, emotional breakthrough inventory separates is whether the challenging experience, that kind of challenge was resolved, whether it was expressed or released, or whether a person was like stuck with that. So those who are probably just in challenge the whole, the whole time and do not resolve the challenge uh, may be related to anxiety or resistance. Uh, so the therapeutic outcome in these patients yeah. Is, yeah. is less profound. Yeah. What you say um, is it really does does it really um, I, my naive uh, imagination is that every patient uh, will have a challenging a somewhat challenging experience during a high dose psilocybin mm. trip mm. right yeah 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 I guess the the model that we're working in the lab with and we're influenced from Bill Richards from Hopkins uh, and from other uh, psychedelic therapists whether underground or over, overground. Uh, so it's kind of like the idea of in and through. So if there's a challenge, you kind of look at it in the eyes and you know, go through the challenge to the other side. The other side can be catharsis, it can be uh, ecstatic, it can be mystical, but it's like you go through the challenge. Uh, mm. But the question is, what happens if you don't go through? You know, if you're yeah. just kind of stuck stuck with it. Yeah. But most of most sessions, they have there's challenge. Sometimes people get their, like a fun ride of pure bliss, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, my, my thinking um, is the, the question, um, what happens or what, what, what is the learning? I'm, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, so, so I'm always <laughs> thinking, in, uh, rigidly thinking in terms of learning. So my, mm -hmm. my um, thinking of it is always, um, what, do people learn from these challenging experiences? And of course, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very different. Um, it's a very different uh, experience when you learn, or when you have the experience that you can actually uh, engage with or mm -hmm. accept certain mm -hmm. uh, very strong negative feelings and that it doesn't mm -hmm. hurt you. And mm -hmm. that you might even learn something uh, valuable from it, like those cognitive insights that you've uh, mentioned, mm -hmm. or that you might even um, learn something about your needs or your mm -hmm. values from it. And mm -hmm. um, on the other side, if you don't manage to, to or if the patient does not manage to, um, to accept um, challenging aspects of the experience, then they might learn something completely different. They might learn um, I, I, like avoidance related or avoidance promoting beliefs might actually be strengthened and mm -hmm. uh, reinforced. So mm -hmm. in my opinion, um, one of the, the, the central tasks of psychedelic therapists would be within the preparation, but also in the dosing session would be to prepare the patient and the setting in such a way that um, the learning process facilitating acceptance during the psychedelic mm -hmm. experience is um, uh, made as probable as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I also I also think that there is a, um, a unique uh, opportunity uh, with psychedelics um, because they, they seem to kind of condition uh, acceptance. Mm -hmm. but they seem to have an inherent um, property of or an inherent um, yeah, property of, of uh, rewarding acceptance and punishing avoidance. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just have to um, get the ball rolling in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, once once this is the patient notices it, this uh, dynamic, that mm -hmm. it gets better when you let go, mm -hmm. then, then it's kind of an automatic thing in my thinking. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. There's like, yeah, practice of like letting go and people learn what does that mean. And acceptance, I like how you framed it. It's kind of like there's an incentive for acceptance. Like when you accept the ride is easier, uh, you'll get to somewhere more interesting. When you resist, you're probably most of the time kind of stuck somewhere or looping something. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the therapies is around acceptance. Uh, yeah. And then it can translate into day-to-day -day life, of course. So you kind of learn to navigate the psychedelic 
experience with acceptance and you also learn to kind of navigate your life more with acceptance. Mm. Yeah. So do you think you use the, the, so the, the emotional breakthrough inventory has been validated in, in the survey? Do you also use it in, uh, in clinical studies? Yes, we use it in like, since then we use it in clinical studies and other clinical studies are using it. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. to, to, yeah. <laughs> So yeah. before you said that uh, um, mystical experiences and, and emotional breakthrough experiences, they explain some common variants, but also some mm -hmm. uh, unique variants um, in changes in well-being. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the changes in well-being, those are just numbers. Um, mm -hmm. This is more a question of interpretation. So what, what how would you characterize the, those unique and the common um, uh, portions of, of variants, in, uh, mm. um, if you understand what I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. So, what kind of change is explained that you see after therapy? Long-term change mm. is explained more by by mystical type experiences, and what mm. kind of change are, are more explained by by emotional breakthrough? Mm. Is there a way? Is there a way of knowing? Or? It will. It will be speculative right now. What I say, so it's like not. Uh, but I think, yeah, the, the mystical type experience. They're more probably related to what you said with acceptance, equanimity, uh, openness, uh, and maybe emotional breakthroughs are related to yeah reduction in, in stress. Uh, so more like emotional catharsis. But uh, sometimes the emotional breakthrough come with insights together we don't quantify that but a lot of times mm -hmm. it comes with a certain realization so there's also like a cognitive element to both mystical type experiences and emotional breakthrough so mm -hmm. the cognitive element of emotional breakthrough is more autobiographical usually uh, while the cognitive element of mystical experiences is more like on the spiritual mm -hmm. on the spiritual realm uh, yeah so i think maybe it's somehow related to that that would be really interesting to have more differentiated measures of long-term outcomes to to kind mm -hmm. of uh now we're speculating right but yeah uh, it would be nice to to really disentangle uh, yeah for sure well-being because it can mean so many things well-being even depression yeah. of course can mean so many things yeah so, for sure yeah uh, yeah and even the way we measure well-being there's a lot of like there's a lot of things there like which yeah. measures to use and stuff like this I have a uh, thought about um, the common variance uh, mm. that's explained by both uh, emotional breakthrough and, and mm -hmm. mystical uh, or ego dissolution experiences. So mm -hmm. my, my thinking is that mm, they might be related just because um, if you're, especially in this setting, right, lying down with eye shades, and uh, if you're in an avoidant state of mind, if you're in a, in a non-accepting uh, uh, set, so to say, mm -hmm. um, you will be moving around more. You will be talking to your therapists more. You will okay. get a lot of a lot of more um, uh, detailed sensory input that mm -hmm. will all lead to a grounding effect. Your your it will be harder for your ego to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. You have your eyes open, mm -hmm. for example, and also a, a lot of avoidance strategies that people. Uh, um, may engage in even with eyes closed and with the music on and mm -hmm. even when they're not moving um, mm -hmm. a lot of avoidance strategies may involve self-referential processes mm -hmm. such as worrying uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what's going to happen with me uh, you know this kinds of thoughts mm -hmm. always has a, mm -hmm. has a, has a, this, uh, incorporates the self mm -hmm. and I could imagine that this kind of uh, hinders ego dissolution Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. uh, and then it's it's because you're you're not accepting, you're less likely to have an emotional breakthrough, and you're also mm -hmm. likely to have a uh, uh, an ego dissolution experience. And then the ego dissolution, um, if it was only that, so there is mm -hmm. we know that there is also um, unique variants explained by by uh, by uh, mystical type experiences, mm -hmm. but. Uh, one could say that if it wasn't like that, I think there's another study from uh, from the, I think it was Alan Coy Davis. He had this uh, paper uh, where um, psychological flexibility was 
predict changes in psychological flexibility were predicted by uh, mm -hmm. psychological insight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And this was this was completely mediated by, uh, or the, the effect of, of mystical type experiences mm -hmm. was completely mediated by changes in flexibility, mm -hmm. um, the, the effects on, on well-being. So yeah. one, one could say, one could interpret that in a way that mystical type experiences are actually just uh, um, kind of an epiphenomenon, like a marker that someone has been able to let go so much that their ego disintegrated. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a bit provocative or... No, it's actually like, so you're saying acceptance is like an, un, might be an underlying uh, mechanism in a way of change. And yeah, it might be an epiphenomenon, but maybe it's an necessarily, it's like a reward one that's kind of necessary to kind of tell you that you manage, you know, you manage. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a massive reinforcement of, if it's that, if, if mystical experiences, of the positive kind follow yeah. from from achieving deep states of acceptance mm -hmm. then it's the greatest uh, yeah. um, reinforcement that you can imagine for, for yeah. that people will never forget yeah. how they got to the to the, to that yeah. state yeah i kind of always see the, there's something in the mystical type experience that is kind of like marks the event is unique so you develop this kind of like so then in the integration uh, you develop a certain loyalty to that event in your life. Uh, so whatever insight, whatever emotional breakthrough, whatever other process that happened along this mystical type experience, uh, you would work more in integrating it because you kind of consider it as a transformative moment in your life. Mm. It's kind of like a certain mark on a moment. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, really, really fantastic insights. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering, so um, apart from 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 your work in in this um, in this uh, survey studies and, and in the, the depression uh, um, study, you, you also uh, you mentioned you you also um, you're also interested in the peace building mm -hmm. capacities of of ayahuasca. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, first of all, I mean, how did you come up with that idea? Is, is that idea your own or, or is this, is this uh, uh, from somewhere? The, the amount of people that told me, yeah, I thought about putting uh, psychedelics in the water uh, <laughs> is, is so huge that I cannot like, you know, the, the, idea, the idea of psychedelics in a piece is just like out there. It's not, yeah, sure. it's not it, doesn't, it doesn't belong to, to anyone. To anyone, uh, right. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of like trying to materialize it and try to investigate it, yeah, that's kind of a path that I chose. It comes uh, from my own uh, experiences in groups with ayahuasca and feeling a strong kind of group energy and wanting to to investigate that. And my my own personal use of psychedelics, the relational was always an important aspect of the of my psychedelic process and i felt that through research i'm not able to discuss the relational so much uh, because they the therapy research is focused of eye shades eye closed very much inner uh, and uh, the neuroscience uh, research is in inside an mri also enclosed in your own kind of uh, mri bubble so I felt that through research, I don't manage to uh, explore the relational. And, and there was also a yearning, I'm Israeli, a yearning to do something that's related to, to Israel. Mm -hmm. So it was like, if there's a, it's like, okay, I want to study the relational. What's a relational problem? Conflict. I want to study the, like the conflict mm -hmm. and how psychedelics can interact with that. That's quite straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. There's so many, so many uh, interesting questions like I've asked right now. So do, is uh, I, I heard somewhere that ayahuasca is also being used for it has been used in South America for for peace building. Is that correct? Or it has been tried to? I've heard of like I tried to connect to a, a certain curandero there uh, that used it in that way. So between tribes, so he, sometimes elders of different tribes came to, came to him, and he would kind of mediate uh, with ayahuasca. Uh, there are a few thoughts about like there's a Colombian study that might happen, uh, but it's still like everything is kind of very in, kind of in initial steps. But they heard I heard that it was used. I never spoke with a person. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
So mm, we've talked about- I, heard, I, I guess I heard also that like somebody that was there observing that, like an, a guy that I know, told me that that uh, that ritual started with like the elders fighting a lot mm -hmm. and, and then uh, and then kind of like dissolving that I, and I guess that's kind of similar to what we spoke about in and through and starting with uh, with a conflict mm -hmm. whether it's internal or ex or or, be, or relational and then resolving that mm -hmm. right so you did a you did a like to start this this project going with uh, Ayahuasca for peace building uh, mm -hmm. in, in Israel and Palestine. You you did a, a, a qualitative study, mm -hmm. um, yeah. observational study. Could you explain a bit what what you did there and what you found? Yeah, so I observed uh, groups of Israelis and Palestinians that drink ayahuasca together. They don't drink it uh, with the intention of peace building. It's more like regular psycho spiritual uh, growth or, sh or neo shamanism. Uh, so it's not like there's no political discussions in there. It's like they're very apolitical and they're not with that intention of reconciliation. So they're mainly come for personal processes. It just happens to be that they're like inclusive and they share the same space. Usually there's a minority of Palestinians in there. Uh, and it, it used to be that Palestinians uh, could manage, could ha had access to ayahuasca only through Israelis. Uh, cause like Israelis are much more like psychedelic culture, psychedelic use is much more like popular uh, by Israelis. So like the access of Palestinians was usually through that, but that has changed. And now there's also like Palestinian shamans, uh, that kind of work only with Palestinian population. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, the question was, what was we, what we found there? Yes, or, or first of all, like, uh, so what was the, the, the field that you did research in? I, from my, what I understand is, because this is not published uh, uh, mm -hmm. yet, right? this is, you talked about this on, on, on Breaking Convention. Yeah. Uh, may, maybe Patrick could post the, the link to the video of that talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and um, he's really good in the background. Uh, thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, so from what, what I understand, uh, this is a, like a naturalistic uh, setting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all the, uh, the groups that were interviewed were, were um, groups where Palestinians and Israelis do ayahuasca together. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so the things I presented in Breaking Convention, things I write about now. Uh, so there's two, two drafts already read, ready from this kind of research. Uh, it's kind of focused on like again on relationality and what how people experience how people affect each other in that context so even if the context is personal growth sitting as a jewish israeli person sitting next to an arab palestinian muslim and just next sitting next to each other would affect uh people uh, but there's also the ayahuasca rituals in israel and elsewhere a lot of times there there's a participatory element so the shaman or the helpers might lead the ceremony half of the ceremony and then in the other half they might open kind of the the stage for other participants to to sing uh, usually to sing or to express something in other ways and that kind of uh, brings a lot of relationality into the space uh, so it means that even if an arab participant is not part of like the organizers uh, he still has an opportunity to to express uh like a, a muslim prayer or sing in arabic and that kind of affects space so the things that we we found is that people the three themes was uh people experiencing like these oneness unitive moments as a group as a collective and these usually are moments beyond identity uh, moments of like beyond israeli palestinian we're all humans we're all connecting to each other we're all one brain and this is kind of like something that is known from ritual studies. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an experience called communitas uh, from ritual studies, not without even psychedelics, that a lot of rit rituals are defined for this like collective moments. In a way, it's like a, yeah, it's like the, it's almost the, the mystical experience on it's like social, on a social level, right? Uh, that that's kind of like the, the how to summarize it, maybe. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I like the way that uh, now that we're starting about mystical uh, things in ayahuasca, you're, you're lighting 
<laughs> changed and you're you're completely sitting in a dark jungle now <laughs> yeah really i nice. actually actually the sun is just kind of hit me right yeah, now nice. so. That's a, that's a, <laughs> uh, so that, uh, that's the, the so there's this this merging this it's kind of related to to mystical type experiences in, exactly in, yeah it's kind of similar so communitas is in a way a kind of collective peak experience it's usually full of joy and celebration uh, as well uh, but there then there Sorry, is the is the awareness that that you're uh, having the experience, sharing the same experience with other people, is that relevant, uh, or would you yes have the same? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely. There, there's a strong, like in these moments, strong awareness of the group. Uh, so the oneness of the group, the groups kind of can become a unit. Uh, so yeah, that that plays a big part there, and I, I guess the kind of the mystical shedding of identities and ego uh, allows a certain connection which is kind of kind of people say connection based on the core uh, of like we are all humans and it's kind of shedding these identities mm -hmm. to help people connect as humans mm -hmm. uh, but if that was it like the research i would say would be quite problematic mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of like within like research of reconciliation groups and peace building actually just saying we're all live in harmony and coexistence uh, while outside uh, there's def definitely strong like power dynamics or oppression or occupation so there's injustice or inequalities in real life so creating a mo just moments of harmony might not actually be beneficial for systemic change uh, so what what also happens in these rituals sometimes is connection actually based on identities. So uh, as an Israeli, when an Arab woman or an Arab man sings in, uh, Arab Palestinian sings in Arabic, uh, that can kind of, I can connect to that, to, to that culture uh, through his expression or her expression. And a lot of times people describe these moments as like strong moments of recognition uh, in which like peace is felt in the air as if like the unspoken was said uh, with music uh, mm -hmm. because the space is very much apolitical and universal and a lot of people sometimes pe people speak about being beyond identity but that sometimes actually can conceal uh, that these identities play important part in real life so recognition of that can be quite important and quite revealing actually for many people so it's usually very can be very emotion, emotional these like moments of recognition of like the other yeah so whether a palestinian listens to something in hebrew or whether a jewish israeli listens to something in arabic it can be quite emotional for the group as well mm. i could imagine that the that um, the, the, yeah, the, the sound of hebrew language for for palestinian arabs or vice versa yeah uh, has strong associations Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and a lot, of, a lot of times people speak about the language and the frequency of the language and actually learning to connect to the language. Uh, is usually there's some, the language can trigger people and there's fear and kind of learning to collect, connect to that. Uh, so a lot of times actually the first encounter with like the other's language can be actually create certain anxiety in the mm -hmm. ritual, anxiety, mm -hmm. paranoia even, uh and resistance and there's kind of also acceptance of that in order to actually connect to the beauty of it as well mm. that's uh, interesting that, that's really interesting that, that i see a parallel there between uh, um, experiences new experiences with that people have with their own emotions mm -hmm. and, and standard psychedelic therapy and, and new experiences that people have with other people Mm -hmm. or with other other cultures can i can i say just just a moment sorry <laughs> i was wondering what am i doing here <laughs> yeah just in the moment where we're talking about uh, encounters with other people uh-huh yeah. yeah so that uh, i was just uh, i'm uh, telling you my, my thought that there's some parallel there uh, between the way people uh, manage to count to to um, find new ways of relating to their own emotions Mm -hmm. in standard psychedelic therapy and the way mm -hmm. that people um, discover new perspectives on on other cultures or other languages yes yeah there's a parallel 
<clears throat> I think the framework, I don't know if you know the work of like of Robin, my supervisor, he has like this theory called Rebus. It's relaxed beliefs under psychedelics and kind of suggesting that top down prior beliefs or identities, they relax with psychedelics, which allow bottom up uh, kind of uh, processes to be more influential, whether it's internal or external. Uh, and I think uh, what is all like what is interesting in this theory is suggesting that uh, we know from other research that like beliefs, identities, they play a psychological uh, role and, and a modification of them might lead to initial resistance. So because if you change your identity or change your belief, it might reduce the psychological role of that belief. And so you might kind of fight that in the beginning. And I think the resistance that can happen in therapy or the resistance can, that can happen in these groups when one is listening to the music of the other uh, is related to that of like something is trying to find a shift in belief or ideology or identity. Mm. And the acceptance is also accepting that you actually by, might be modified and your identity might be modified mm. after that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a, a, a psychoanalyst, uh, but but I I really believe the the, the term ego defense uh, is quite um, yeah. yeah quite fitting here in this context. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and also, so, it's in con in conflict studies. It's also like the ethos that is developed around the conflict, the identity that developed around a conflict has an existential function. Uh, mm. It kind of gives a certain excuse to the conflict and why you live in conflict. Mm. And so shifting that can kind of play, actually reduce well-being uh, for a moment. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that, that these uh, encounters or when, when members of the other group start singing, initially this, this can, can lead to resistance or it can lead to challenging experience. Mm -hmm. And what happens then uh, commonly? It, person can be stuck in that or a person can learn to accept or he'll like it i can tell you a story of one muslim woman who who kind of was stuck with her, that resistance she she thought that like the jews are about to brainwash her and she was very much like kind of worried uh, and i mean there are two similar stories in one of them uh, she started to sing herself uh, and kind of to show her identity in a way, and that kind of released it for her. And in the other, she went to her friend, uh, a Muslim friend, and he, he read to her a few verses from the Quran. And then she kind of uh, kind of settled in and felt more uh, belong. So the music of your own culture or the prayers of your own culture can feel you, make you feel safe uh, in that space uh, or belonging. And that kind of allows the trust in a way which is crucial for acceptance. Mm. That's really that's really a beautiful story. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, maybe the, the the third theme yes, uh, I was going to ask yeah. was uh, kind of conflict related revelations and in a way a lot of times these were triggered by the presence of the other uh, in the group. And these are visions, usually uh, visionary visions that relate to the conflict. They can be uh, personal or it can be somebody experiencing the other side. Uh, so an Israeli soldier who kind of had a flashback of himself in the army doing a house, house arrest. And then uh, kind of a very casual house arrest. And then he re-experienced everything from the side of the Palestinian family. and kind of stays in their home while they feel the pain when like the son is taken by soldiers. Uh, and, and there are kind of stories like this, a Palestinian kind of imagining himself as a Israeli shooting a Palestinian and kind of staying with the shame and the guilt that's associated with that, mm. uh, or visions that relate to the pain of the land. So a uh, few Arab women had visions of the, the bleeding land, uh, and the pain of the, the land and the pain, like the, the mothers who sacrificed their children. Uh, for, for the conflict and kind of like these war visions and a lot of times these are triggered by the presence of the other and a lot of times they they're quite hard they can lead to even to anger uh, and 
and but they can do something to the whole group. So a lot of times the individual itself who experienced that tries to share that message with the rest of the group. And in a way, he shifts the whole uh, ritual uh, from having a revelation like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So would you say this, this uh, third aspect, uh, it kind of reminds me of um, something that I believe happens a lot in, in uh, uh, shamanistic or ritualistic settings where ayahuasca is used in, in, in Latin America, where people have a powerful connection to nature and to, to the, the, like the, yeah, the, the, the pain of nature or the, the hmm. drama that is happening in front of our eyes and that we mm -hmm. sometimes manage to maybe to, to repress and not think about. Mm -hmm. but, so could it be that there, there is generally in these ceremonies a, a, a way of that they um, bring um, the most pressing societal or even ecological problems of mm. the, uh, the given um, society, uh, mm -hmm. bring it up to, uh, into people's consciousness or even collective consciousness? Yeah, I think so. Uh, because even if the setting tries to be apolitical, when you have Israelis and Palestinians sitting together, there is a political energy uh, in the space. And if you hear suddenly an airplane, uh, if you were doing the ceremony in the desert, the, the army trains there, and there's an airplane, it kind of reminds you of the conflict. Or you hear the muazin, uh, the Arab prayer in the morning, it kind of reminds you of the conflict. Mm -hmm. So you cannot escape the conflict in the land of Israel and Palestine. And there would always be triggers. Uh, and it, so it will always leak into the personal experiences. Israel is also an, an incredibly small country if you look at it on a map. So you can't no. really go far away from from everything there, right? Uh, no, yeah, it's very it's very small, yeah, and yeah. narrow and small. Right. Yeah. So what, what would you say um, about these this last type of experience, what, what did you call it, uh, this last type of? Um... I call it conflict-related revelations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I might even call it prophetic events, prophetic moments. Yeah. Uh, depends. Uh, when a person transmits a message to the other based on the revelation, mm -hmm. I would call it a prophetic process. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So if, if we're, we, we draw, uh, we try to draw a parallel with what we talked about before in, in the context of classic standard psychedelic therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is again like speculation now because we don't have quantitative data on this, but what would you say, what would be long-term effects of, of such experiences if, if, uh, if integrated well? It depends what you're trying to achieve. Uh, if you try to achieve harmony in that small group of individuals coming together, then I would say communitas or uh, the mystical experience, the kind of group mystical experience that breaks identities and connect everybody in celebration and joy. That would be the, the thing, you know. Uh, but if you try to create larger change in society, I'm not sure if that is the predictor. So it's actually, first of all, you need what, what predicting what, you know. Uh, and the question in conflict resolution studies is what is conflict resolution, how to achieve it is quite complex. Uh, yeah, so I, I say communitas, if, if that's engagement with uh, harmony of the local group, that that's communitas. If it's engagement with larger political reality, I would say it's those revelations that have a strong influence. Uh, and if it's a kind of a fusion of identities and like a kind of a more multicultural mysticism in which there's a dialogue between different religions and interfaith kind of uh, process, then those uh, listening to the music of the other and the music of the other kind of igniting a spiritual experience in you would be the, the, the experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That, that is so, so interesting. I, of course, we're, we're speculating and... and mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of exciting uh, quantitative research to be done. And, and um, I hope to read some of that mm -hmm. in a few years from you. Yeah. Looking yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to be fun <laughs> and provocative. Right, yeah. Important work, too, really. Huh? Uh, really appreciate it. Mm. 
So if we, we try to, to connect the things that we talked about today, um, standard psychedelic therapy in these group settings. Mm-hmm. So um, it seems to me like the, the standard model of psychedelic therapy that's being investigated now in, in a lot of uh, studies in, in England, and we're going to start in, in Germany as well, in, in the United States, in Holland, mm-hmm. even Brazil. Um, it's, it's an individualistic model that, uh, or let's say it accommodates the, the Western medical model where individuals mm-hmm. are treated um, mm-hmm. in, in a maximal way. Uh, you, you cannot not have an anti or an asocial um, psychedelic treatment because people need to be supported. People need to be in a safe relationship with therapists. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not, it's by definition never completely uh, isolated treatment, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's it's still probably the least socially embedded um, imaginable psychedelic treatment that, that would mm-hmm. be safe to administer. Mm-hmm. Um, so given that that that's hu- the human experience and, and human suffering and, and even uh, um, mental disorders are are social experiences. Um, would you say the, the the common model is really, or the the, the current model is really um, already ideal, or would it be a good yeah. idea to 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 uh, introduce some variations? Yeah, I, I believe very much in group therapy is a way to go in the future, uh, because as you say, if we uh, if we believe that a lot of the mental uh, mental concerns in our society are because of social relational uh, problems. So whether trauma is relational, most of the times, uh, alienation, loneliness are kind of prevailing. So addressing it in relational means, in my opinion, is important, not necessarily negating the importance of inner experiences. It is super important, but just adding to it another relational element would be crucial. Uh, the group therapy and, you know, in the end, um, Ayahuasca rituals are, first of all, they are, uh, people go there for psycho-spiritual growth. And in a way, shamans or neo-shamans in like in Western ayahuasca context, they're also therapists. They work in groups. And even in these groups, usually it's about individual process. People are uh, asked not to intervene in each other process. And sometimes it actually blocks relational kind of processes. Uh, but sometimes it's for a group of beginners, it's kind of like, easier you know because the relational field can confuse things it can be hard for people to engage in that it might be easier for people with more experience Uh, i think that in psychedelic therapy in the end it will inevitable go to uh, group therapy uh, just because it's more cost effective and market forces uh, will win Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. in that kind of very capitalistic <laughs> kind yeah, of notion. Yeah. But like even one time a shaman told me that, you know, uh, he said, we're treating, we're working with groups because it's cost effective. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can treat many people with less people, with less ter- with less facilitators. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, but it, it would still be, uh, I mean, <coughs> the Western medical model and group therapies, they're, they're nowadays group therapies are usually done, I, Apart from some group therapies, maybe in, in psychosis or, or so, mm-hmm. group therapies is mostly done with patients, right? People with a diagnosis. Yeah. And um, when we really move away from from treating individuals, but to and go to treating um, communities or, or treating um, families or, or yeah. social systems, then the, the model would have to change in such a way that we treat not only patients but also their, their yep. friends and family and, and maybe their work colleagues yeah the the ideal situation would be a local community around it with a diverse people not specific any any specific mental uh, uh problem but actually a diverse people that kind of learn from each other and support each other empower each other mm-hmm. and Unlike right right now, many people go to retreats, whether it's uh, Sarasabin retreats or uh, ayahuasca retreats. And we know from our research and other research that strong com- groups happen in these retreats, but they are, each person is kind of going back to his own country, to his own life, 
and these groups are quite momentary uh, but using that kind of power of like the psychedelics to build communities in a local sense in which you live with this community on a daily basis can be quite powerful yeah yeah, yeah. right yeah so Leo, i'm afraid we're already approaching our our 60 minutes mark mm -hmm. but yeah. so um as this this conversation is gonna we're, we're gonna move to the to the q a in a bit but uh, here's a question that I ask every uh, every guest uh, so far um, for our audience. So could you name one or two academic papers or books or books, yeah. videos or films or uh, anything that has influenced your or enriched your views of psychedelics or psychedelic yeah. therapy that you'd like to recommend to our audience? Yeah, I think just because I spoke about uh, relationality and that in, the importance of this, so I would recommend uh, Ferrer's uh, book called uh, Revisioning Transpersonal uh, Theory. And this book, he kind of deconstructs transpersonal theory and how we approach it in uh, Western society, and then reconstruct it again with a more relational uh, elements. Um, so one of the things there would be that like the mysticism uh, of, of in our society is very much uh, focused on like oneness and non-dual experiences and and the dissolution of self uh, while he argues that mysticism is actually in many traditions is about like liberation uh, and kind of putting that context into mysticism uh, more in the more relational context and the other book would be uh, martin's buber martin buber's uh, i and thou uh, which is a brilliant relational spiritual mystical book that written a hundred years ago but very very well captures uh, the criticism uh, of mysticism and also how to kind of go beyond it uh, and as a german uh, audience uh, it's it was written yeah it's quite cryptic quite cryptic the good book, book at least in the beginning but it definitely a worth recommended reading yeah. fantastic i am though ich und du in german mm -hmm. so yeah that's uh that's that's fantastic i think it's a very good fit for for uh, what we've talked about today, Patrick has has posted the the links to those books if you're interested in the chat. Mm. Well, Lior, uh, I always feel like we could continue our, our conversation uh, much longer, but uh, I'm afraid we have to go to the the Q and A. Actually, I'm happy we can also go to the Q and A because we always have great questions from uh, from our audience. Mm -hmm. Can you see the questions? Uh, I open the Q and A. Yeah. Yes. How does it work now? Do I choose or you choose? Uh, we can both choose. We're we're uh, we we we're, we're flexible. So you can, if you see one that you like, you can you can read it aloud. I can start from my top. That will be easy. Or yeah, yeah. if you do, you uh, want to moderate it or like how how is it um, usually working? Yeah, we we just we just look at the questions. I, I have to uh, to to look to. If you see one that you find interesting, just. Uh, just let me know. Just say I found one. Uh -huh. Actually, they're all in interesting again. Uh, so the first question is, uh, where can we best follow the research you and your lab are doing at Imperial? Uh, I guess in our website. Uh, so Center of Psychedelic Research, Imperial College London. And then there's like all of the people on the team and the research and uh, yeah. And I would suggest also watching YouTube uh, videos of lectures from Breaking Convention or different conferences. They're usually quite good. Um, are there studies planned yet for which different kinds of psychotherapy are compared CBT, ACT, uh, depth psychology, or are consideration for a different new methodology? I think CBT, oh, uh, I, mean, I think CBT and psychedelics, there's some group in the US, you know, maybe about it? Uh, um, well, I mean, th there have been studies with, with CBT already. Uh, I think yeah, the, 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 the uh, cigarettes, right? The nicotine studies of yeah. Matt Johnson, they, they have used CBT. I mean, yeah. ACT is also is, is a kind of CBT. It's like a third yeah. new, new uh, uh, yeah. kind of third wave CBT. Um, you're, uh, from what I understand, the, 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 the latest psilocybin depression study in London uh, has used an ACT-based. Yeah, it's kind of influenced. So Roz Watts, she's trained in, uh, she's the main clinical uh, therapist and she's trained in ACT. And then it's also her kind of qualitative research from the first study was 
about acceptance and connection that people kind of discussed uh, through that happened after the therapy. And then she developed a model which is kind of based on Mac, uh, ACT, but it's an option. Yeah. She has a, a really great talk on, on uh, the Mind Foundation's YouTube channel that she gave on our conference last year, the Inside Conference. It's called yeah. Accept, Connect, and Body. Um, yeah, exactly. Ace. Maybe you can you can post the link, Patrick. Uh, yeah. that's, that's a really nice talk. Very inspiring. Yeah. I like this question. Are there any considerations? <laughs> about, about what? <laughs> uh, are there any considerations? <laughs> Yes, there are <laughs> many. Uh, maybe, maybe Laura can answer and uh, ask what she meant. Yes. Laura, do you want to join maybe, us? Maybe the maybe the following question is the. Yes, uh, that's just the point. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, that's related. Uh, any considerations in combination with psychedelics? Of course. Uh, not sure how Not to answer sure. that then. Yeah, yeah no, sorry. And Laura, you could ask a question now if you want to. Uh, hi. Actually, hey. it should be one question. So my question is, are there any studies planned yet for which the different kinds of psychotherapy are compared? For example, CBT, ACT, depth psychology, or are there considerations for a different or a completely new methodolog methodology uh, in combination with uh, psychedelics, of course? Actually, uh -huh. this should be one question. <laughs> Yes, so I'm not aware. Yeah, that's what we answer. Where I'm not aware, except of the CBT and the nicotine. I mean, uh, regarding, uh, she's asking, like comparing, for example, CBT yeah. with ACT or psychodynamic theory. That's not being done, no. And it's also, I mean, even outside of psychedelic research, that's rarely mm. done. Mm. Even in psychotherapy research without psychedelics, that, that's a very rare thing to compare mm. or to play out kind of two, uh, two different therapy schools. Mm -hmm. um, against each other, that would be probably a, 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 quite a political act to do that. So uh, I don't think we're going to see that anytime soon with, with or without psychedelics. Um, mm -hmm. But we're going to see a lot of more, from what I understand, in the, in the next years, we're going to see a lot of more um, psychedelic therapy studies where the, the minimal model is extended and where there is more psychotherapy taking place that that for sure uh, would you agree with that Lior? yes i agree yeah uh yes mm -hmm. depends but yeah i know a study of uh, like in israel that they plan with a much longer model but then also market forces join in and they want to short shorten everything make things cheaper and more efficient uh, so there will be also a stripping down of, of therapy as well so i think there will be pools to both sides mm. right yeah that's a good point I found a good, uh, interesting question here. So, uh, how can you teach? This is by Daniela Edler. How can you teach or train letting go to a patient so that the patient most probably learns to deal with challenging experiences rather than to learn avoidance? Yeah, yeah it's a opinion? hard, it's a hard one, uh, and it's usually easier said than done. Letting go, uh, like everybody that's like has experiences with psychedelics know that many times you resist and you're stuck in resistance and it's quite hard. But there are a few ways, like, uh, so uh, Bill Richards kind of, and there's a mantra that we learned from Bill Richards in our studies of trust, let go, be open, and just repeating those in moment of stuckness. And it kind of helps to even verbally repeat something, uh, it helps release. And uh, sometimes, you need some emotional support next to you uh, in these moments to, in order to let go. Uh, but it's, there's no clear method yeah. to how to do it. That's I think trust, I think trusting is the underlying element of letting yeah. go. Uh, trust. Whether you trust the people around you or whether you trust yourself. So enhancing both of these things before a session would be crucial. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I would also add that um probably um most studies that are taking place nowadays um incorporate some kind of at least minimal mindfulness training mm -hmm. um and mindfulness training in general i mean it has been shown in recent years that there is there seems to be a, a reciprocal relationship between mindfulness exercise or mindfulness practice formal mindfulness practice 
mm-hmm. and the benefit of of using uh, psychedelics or the benefit of, of uh, psychedelic interventions. So mm-hmm. uh, mindfulness and, and acceptance or mindfulness and letting go are, are, are I think, are, are very much related con- concepts. And uh, this is something that, that really can be trained. The question is, can it be trained well uh, with only two uh, sessions for preparation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and many, many people would doubt that, yeah. um, I'm sure. Yeah, sometimes doing like other things, like a holotropic breath work before, uh, like as part of the preparation uh, can be good. Sometimes people begin with like lower doses. Uh, Yeah. Mm. Here's another, here's a related question by Alex Koshilev. At which point the therapist stops punishing the patient for their avoidance of confrontation? What are the indicators that the patient will not break through this in this session and the therapist should stop trying to push and encourage? Mm-hmm. Is it the number of unsuccessful attempts, specific reactions, like mm-hmm. tears becoming unresponsive or something else? That's a very interesting uh, question. Although, I mean, I, I should add that it's probably not the therapist himself or herself that punishes the the, the, the patient for, for avoiding, but it's it's rather the it's like the experience in combination with that particular setting mm-hmm. that does that punishing. But th- I think there is a uh, an interesting um, point in this question. There, there, there should be a balance between encouraging acceptance and supporting avoidance, right? Mm-hmm. Is that is that something that... Um, yes, I think actually sometimes it is punishing. I kind of tend to agree with this. Sometimes the discourse around acceptance put everything on the um, kind of all the responsibility on the patient himself. Uh, and sometimes resistance might be about the re- relation with the therapist uh, that can kind of in- interfere in acceptance. Uh, there, are, I mean, there are many elements, and some of them are related to the ther- therapeutic alliance, and uh, and sometimes just this is the case, and there's no need to push somebody too much, because if you do, you can kind of can create a sense of like failure in him, because when acceptance becomes the goal uh, and idealized, then a failure can actually be harmful. Uh, mm. uh, so. Paradox of mindfulness. Yes, exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, so I think that's a sensitivity that a therapist learns learns yeah. to, to do that. Well, the, maybe, the, the therapist yeah. needs to also see, learn his own reactions because sometimes he feels disappointed. He, he, he really wants that person to accept and let go. And when there is a failure, uh, the the therapist also feels also failure maybe even with himself uh, mm-hmm. that he wasn't a good sitter enough he didn't hold a good enough space and things like this so all of these needs to like uh, be reflected on yeah. I, I would also add that maybe one simple thing or maybe one simple rule of thumb that one might consider is the mere du- duration of a challenging experience so we know from from uh, from empirical research that the duration of it's 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 specifically the duration of challenging experiences that predicts mm-hmm. negative long term outcomes yeah so um, if if a challenging experience is not resolved in within a reasonable amount of time and and then again we should ask what is a reasonable amount of time that that's certainly where therapeutic experience um, probably plays a big role. But um, this this might mean that the patient is not at the moment um, able to to let go of avoidance strategies, mm-hmm. and yes. then in that case, it it might be therapeutically advisable to to support avoidance mm. in order to kind of to to preserve the patient's motivation to try again at a later point in mm-hmm. time. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I can say from my own experience, like working in a cosmic, like volunteering in Cosmic Air in Boom Festival, where dealing with the most hardcore challenging experiences, uh, sometimes just like being next to a person for a long time without pushing or encouraging uh, is like, it's almost like a magic trick. Like uh, it works somehow, like a lot of the times. 
uh, when when the therapist himself is not attached too much to you know is also letting go. Yeah. yeah. So here's an interesting one. Uh, you touched the subject slightly. This is by yeah. Sivan. Sivan, you touched the subject slightly, especially as someone who's experienced the importance of group dynamic in ayahuasca ceremonies. What is your opinion on a psilocybin group session? We haven't talked much about the differences mm -hmm. between the substances, psilocybin mm -hmm. and ayahuasca. Do you think psilocybin mm -hmm. is generally suited as a group? Um, yes, yes. Uh, there is different cultural associations uh, with both. I think there are different cultural associations probably play a bigger part than the different uh, molecule itself, the different kind of structure of the molecule and the receptor binding. Uh, ayahuasca has a ritualistic culture association while mushrooms in retreats are, are, are very much like with a therapeutic association, but I think they can, you, you can have uh, group sessions with both. You can have, like you can play with both. Uh, yeah. So one of the main differences between ayahuasca and, and, and psilocybin, uh, I would assume, is the intense nausea provoking yes, definitely. Uh, yeah. effect of ayahuasca. So uh, one could assume that that, that has a, a specific or an important therapeutic uh, yes. or an important therapeutic role, make yes. people especially vulnerable. For sure, yeah especially vulnerable, exposing that to other people. Uh, a lot of people speak about how the purge itself uh, is like, they learn to let go uh, from the purge and uh, they kind of release some emotional, psychological baggage in the purge uh, or even in the from the conflict. We had some people reported that they, they kind of purged the, the conflict. Uh, and also a purge or a dysphoric, an intense dysphoric experience as they play a crucial part in like, forming and bonding groups and mm -hmm. i think that's also an important part of the ayahuasca ritual is we're like suffering together uh there's like almost like a com camaraderie uh, in there mm. here's moving over to the to the um to the ayahuasca to the peace building uh, work so here's an interesting one that I, I also wondered about this so what selection bias addressed in the, the palestine israel study um mm -hmm. uh, would the type of people that participate in such a ceremony be uh, pre-select them and, and as being very open-minded? So are these the people that really need peace building most? So the ceremonies that we investigated, uh, we investigated, I have to say I investigated them with uh, Natalie Ginsberg from MAPS and Antoine Saka, who is a Palestinian activist. And we kind of did the investigation together. Uh, and uh, the people go there for psycho-spiritual personal reasons. This means that they can be from all political spectrum. And some of the people come from a lower, more uh, nationalistic background because they didn't come with the intention of peace building to this uh, ritual. They came with intention, personal intentions. They just, their only access to ayahuasca was in these mixed groups. So we have like one uh, Palestinian uh, interviewee who said, that he changed from being like a, a nationalist atheist. So he was never collection, connection, connected to religion, but quite a strong nationalist. So from a national atheist to a pacifist Muslim, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of suddenly stronger connected to religion and spirituality and Islam through his own background, but in a very pacifist way. So, you know, things are kind of, can be quite, uh, I don't know, Confusing and the background of people is quite diverse in these groups. Mm. If the groups were for peace building, uh, then it would be different. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to find out about it at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's another interesting related question. Do you think that this is from Usui? Do you think that negative psychedelic experiences in the context of peace building could hinder the peace process and just make it a risky intervention? like relates to the idea that people could come out worse with worse depression after psychedelic therapy? Uh, peace building, no? Yes, yeah, yeah, this is about yeah. peace building. Yeah. yeah, so, I don't know, there's not a lot of peace process to hinder. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> if the, if the, 
intention is peace building. I don't think you like making it worse would be, it's hard to imagine worse, but yes, you can create uh, the conflict resolution groups that are uh, focused on confrontation and power dynamics and anger and exposing injustice. And sometimes a discourse, which is a bit too much directed to that can create an, uh, the opposite of you just confirm your stigmas and confirm your uh, all kind of the bad things that you think about the other side because all you do is fight. So if like anger is intensified in these moments, not saying that anger is not important, but if it's too intensified, then it can maybe be harmful. Mm. Or if, as I said, even maybe uh, peak collective experiences, beautiful, joyful collective experience can be harmful for a peace process. So in, if, if these deactivate or depoliticize the situation. Right. Looking at further questions here, there's a lot of interesting questions. I'm, I'm always impressed by, by our audience here. Here's a, an interesting one. So how many of the intense peak mystical experiences are normally experienced by the same patient or subject? Is there some kind of habituation? Good question. I'm not On the sure studies, we don't really know because we, do, we don't give so many uh, sessions, right? Yes. Uh, I mean, we have some studies actually that we can look at and there's few predictors of who, who, who experience that. So maybe people who are more easily accepting or trusting uh, or open, maybe they'll have more of that. But there's no, there's no empirical evidence for, for this, I think. Mm -hmm. That yeah, the same people would will be reoccurring. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that, that's actually one of the things that in, in this the psilocybin for depression study that we are planning in Germany. One of the, um, uh, the the new or the innovative aspects of it is uh, going to be that we will compare people who receive only one high dose psilocybin session with people who will receive two. And uh, there's some interesting related, uh, or this question could be partly addressed um, in this in this study because, yeah, one could imagine that people are somehow less likely to have a, uh, another um, peak experience if they've already had one. Mm. Um, I'm not so sure about that actually. I'm I'm more I'm more, uh, uh, or I've thought more in, in the past about uh, challenging and breakthrough experiences. Mm -hmm. How that would be, uh, um, how how that would uh, change after uh, the first experience. I could imagine that having a, a strong breakthrough experience, like a, mm -hmm. a real uh, struggle um, uh, with avoidance, that mm -hmm. where then the, the kind of the shaping process takes place, and and there is a, a breakthrough that is uh, experience is highly rewarding, highly mm -hmm. relieving, and insightful. Um, that that would um, make it much less likely that that would happen again in the, in the next session because people would already probably be somewhat more accepting and then they would still be able to have very um, beneficial therapeutic experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they would be able to address um, uh, emotions or, or yeah. thoughts yeah. Or, or memories that are other, otherwise avoided but they wouldn't experience that so much uh, as a breakthrough. Yes, um, yeah, I agree, yeah, breakthrough, breakthrough might be an experience which relates to a buildup of stress and the release of it. So what you're saying is once it's released, there's maybe not, it won't necessarily build up again in order to be released again, right? And then you can start engaging in other things as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah going that way, yeah. yeah. Do you see any any further? Um, I'm going through the questions here. Do you see any any questions that you find interesting? Mm. Uh, yes, negative experience during psychedelic session getting contagious, so to say, infiltrate the experience of others. Definitely quite common. Uh, usually, an individual who disturbs or people kind of see him as a disturbance 
uh, the kind of the flow of the of the ritual. Uh, it's quite common to see it in rituals, and many people report that happening. And we also have an online study of uh, a large online study of like the the kind of social experiences that happen in rituals, and this is reported there uh, as a disturbance. So it prevents communitas. It's, it prevents that collective uh, peak experience. Yeah, that's an interesting point. We we haven't addressed this much like negative social uh, experiences mm -hmm. during uh, psychedelics. Psychedelic experiences they're very commonplace in in mm. in uh, recreational settings for sure in yeah. ceremonies. Yeah, for sure. It's going yeah, to be sometimes major... the social the social experience the social setting can be quite challenging. It brings a lot of energies that can be confusing. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah. And this thing of a person who is like kind of contaminates the the ritual space is a issue. It's sometimes not just the person itself. It's the relation between the person and the group and that person maybe being more, a bit more alienated. Uh, so he needs to be louder to in some level or maybe something like this. It's like quite speculative, but I don't think it's just the person. It's the person and the group. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I suppose that that's also a... Um... A, a risk that is introduced when you combine a lot of people who haven't met each other uh, mm. in a session, like something that would happen in, in uh, shamanic retreats, touristic retreats in, in, uh, yeah. I don't know, in, in Brazil or in Peru. Uh, that's quite yeah. unlikely to happen in a, in a communitary uh, setting where maybe there is a new person once in a while. Yeah, I agree. And that's, I think, why retreats uh, and sessions, which are very confined in like space and time, they would ask, they try to reduce the relational elements. So they would say, don't interfere with each other process. Uh, we're all just like uh, going through our own inner process, focus on your inner processes. And that's in a way reduce the risk of like, of contamination, but it's also reduced some of the potential as well. And groups that are longer time together, and maybe there's a community and trust that build that was already built in the group, then maybe opening the relational space is like easier. Would this be a, a model for uh, psychedelic group therapies? Let's say like long-term group therapies for people with treatment-resistant depression, uh, that they don't start the group all at once, but it, that's a half-open group where. Uh, you have elders and you have novices yeah. and that's like a proper community a proper you know there's always those with more experience that help even initiate let's say the 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 new ones the newcomers and that's kind of a healthy community yeah i agree mm, yeah so maybe that's that's a, a something that can be modeled after mm -hmm. after yeah. uh, Many, many shamans, uh, Western shamans that I spoke with, they said that they don't accept a lot of like, at least not in retreats, yeah, but those who work in Israel or other places in Europe, they don't accept more than two, three newcomers in a ceremony uh, because these people might need more attention and they are less, they're less aware of how to hold the space for each other. They can interfere more with the space. So there is sometimes a limit of how many newcomers are in a ceremony. Yeah, that relates to the idea how how uh, the, um, uh, some of the benefits or many of the benefits of psychedelics may be related to acquiring the skill of navigating psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Right. So yep. um, being able to 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 uh, manage um, vulnerable, sensitive situations that is a, a skill in itself that. Mm -hmm. Should be considered highly um, salutogenic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Should I look at? Uh, do you find an interesting question? Yes, I have one here again. Is Kaylee, yeah. uh, have you seen patterns of those who have persistent difficulty moving through challenging uh, experiences? Um, has resilience been looked at in relation to uh, those who have been negatively impacted by not having felt like they could complete the work during their psychedelic experience? Uh, so, there, sorry, there are two questions. Is it two yeah. questions there? So two questions. Should we, should we ask Kaylee to, to join us? Um, yeah. Kaylee, if you want to join us, Patrick can, can 
put you on audio. Is she there still? Oh, there she is. Hi, Katie. I think you have your microphone hey, muted. Hi, Katie. You can unmute your microphone and then post Here questions you want. Is that better? Yes. Much better. Okay, perfect. Thank you for taking my question. Um, basically, I wanted to see if there's any kind of relationship or we've seen any patterns with the current research that supports um, those who maybe struggle or don't get to complete, um, you know, whatever um, spiritual task or whatever they felt like they needed to complete in their session. If they don't, um, is there a pattern where you're seeing certain types of characteristics in those who do struggle um, to mm -hmm. complete? And mm -hmm. um, and have we looked at, you know, those characteristics in terms of their relationship to then, you know, that um, poor processing after or, or negative effects after? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so maybe uh, problems of trust can be can be one thing that with these individuals but sometimes it's especially when there's one or two sessions it's just sometimes like it, like the worry is that if a person does not succeed in getting the experience then he would feel a certain like a failure uh, but actually sometimes it's like maybe he needed more uh, preparation uh, more experiences and i think uh, following up on, with these people who didn't get the experience uh, is important and actually quite a hard process of integration and learning uh, from these experiences. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered though the question. <laughs> I think you did. You did quite well. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I'm looking at the at the time now. It's already nine, so we we finished our our Q and A. Um, mm -hmm. There's many more interesting questions we, we can't address right now. But uh, yeah, this is time to say thanks to everyone in, in the audience for attending for and also for the great questions. That's been a lot of fun and very interesting, uh, like the last two times already. Thank you, Patrick, uh, in the background for holding things together. Good job. Pleasure. And of course, uh, thank you, Leo Rosman, for having this conversation with us. Thank it's been a big you. pleasure. Pleasure having this conversation and thanks all for listening and I couldn't see you. Uh, yeah. Very, see you in the real world. Really, really. Uh, <laughs> also really appreciated your your the, the change of, of light in your light. Uh, <laughs> and it was looking like you're having a halo. Do you, do you have any <laughs> do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, not really. All right, great. Yeah. Okay, then before saying saying goodbye to everyone, uh, I'd like to say that there will be more Zooming in webinars in, in August with very exciting guests and topics. So the first one will be with uh, Roberta Murphy. She's actually a, a dear colleague of Lear and uh, Imperial College in London, who was involved in the, the psilocybin depression study, um, doing the clinical work there. Uh, she was a guide mm -hmm. or a therapist <laughs> in that study. And uh, she will chat with me about the role of trust in psilocybin-assisted therapy. So the, the date is not clear yet for that uh, event. It's not set yet, but it will happen in August for sure. So we will inform you about that. And the second one uh, in August will be with Fernanda Pagliano Fontes. She's a, uh, a researcher from Brazil who is investigating ayahuasca for treatment-resistant depression, among other things. And that event will be on August 25th. Here's the um, graphic card for it. You can already see the event on our calendar. And uh, yeah, needless to say, I hope to see many of you again for those two events. And well, now that's enough of me talking for today. Goodbye, everyone.